Hello, everybody, and welcome to ILERA 2020, the 10th International Labor and Employment Relations Association Regional Congress of the Americas. We are here virtually this year, um, but are delivering lots of excellent content to you uh, um, through the Zoom links for the conference and also through these pre recorded links of special events. And today we have a, a very special um, component of the, uh, the annual Canadian Industrial Relations Association conferences, which is the H.D. Woods Lecture. And the H.D. Woods Lecture is named for Harry Douglas Woods um, and has been uh, given uh, at the CIRA conferences since 1984. And the H.D. Woods Lecture is uh, an opportunity for an academic or a practitioner uh, who is um, it comes to the conference and, and gives us a lecture on uh, contemporary issues that are uh, mark very distinctive moments in industrial and labor relations. And this year, I am very pleased and honored um, that Pam Prash is here from the Workers Action Center, and she is the coordinator of the Fight for 15 and Fairness campaign and movement um, as, it, as it grows and builds. And Pam is here to deliver uh, the 2020 um, H.D. Woods Lecture. So hello, Pam. Thanks for joining us. Oh, thank you for having me. We're all very honored to be here. Wonderful. And I'm just going to turn it over to you and you can uh, put your screen, your, your slides up there and, and away you go. Okay, that's perfect. I'm just going to share my screen. Great. Perfect. Now, and hopefully this, yes, perfect. So yes, I'm very honored to be here and very happy to share the lessons that we've learned collectively through this incredible movement uh, that is, as you said, is ongoing. And I thought I would just frame my remarks around uh, five key lessons. And that is have a big vision for what you want to accomplish. Uh, make sure that we center equity in every single thing we do. Uh, don't let them tell you to shut up stay mobilized and keep fighting. So that's the frame of what I'll be talking about today. Uh, but I just wanted to start by giving a little bit of background. Many of you may be familiar with the Fight for 15 movement in the United States. Our movement here in Ontario launched in 2013 around the same time as the Fight for 15, but we launched under the uh, Fight for 14 because we didn't know each other in those days. And so in 2013, we launched our campaign it was called Fair Wages Now, $14 now, and it, we launched it at a time when the minimum wage um, was, uh, had been frozen at $10.25 for four years. And so when we put the demand forward for $14 an hour as the minimum wage, honestly, many people laughed at us and thought that uh, we were dreaming in technicolor. Uh, but what is so remarkable about the campaign is that not only uh, I mean, we didn't win it in the first round, obviously, but within 18 months, we'd want a wage increase uh, to $11, which is the equivalent of a 7% wage increase. So for anyone who's ever bargained a collective agreement, that's a substantial uh, wage increase. But we also won a commitment to uh, indexation of the minimum wage, and that is an adjustment. It's not a wage increase. It's an adjustment to the minimum wage so that it holds its value against rising prices. And of course, in Ontario, the minimum wage had been frozen for 12 of 20 years between 1995 and 2015. So it gives you a sense of how important it is to make sure that we have those annual adjustments. Um, and in addition, out of that first phase of the campaign, we won a comprehensive labor law review in other words, the government uh, made a down payment on the minimum wage by raising it from 1025 to 11 and by indexing it. But then there was a comprehensive commitment to look at all of the labor laws from the Labor Relations Act to the Employment Standards Act. And the reason why this was such a big, important victory for the campaign is that, of course, as everyone knows, you can't possibly talk about the, 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 the level of the minimum wage unless we also talk about hours of work and the pre prevalence of part-time employment, involuntary part-time employment, the casualization of the labor market, the absence of paid sick days, the, 
the, the absence of decent vacation time and all of those different things. So part of our campaign was about starting with something that's a, a, a common denominator for most people, but making sure that it's connected to a much bigger vision. So that was a huge, huge victory, but there was a catch when the uh, Changing Workplaces Review was launched. And that was that they said to us, we're gonna be looking at all of our labor laws, but we've already done, this is what the government said, we've already done everything we're gonna do on the minimum wage. Uh, so the minimum wage, the level of the minimum wage is out of scope. You must not talk about it that in the context of the Changing Workplaces Review. And so we talked to folks, you know, all of the incredible workers who, uh, were involved in the campaign and we asked them should we be shutting up after all this incredible work to 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 build our campaign for a decent minimum wage and they said absolutely not and in fact not only did they say absolutely not they also were very happy to relaunch the campaign under the guise of 15 and fairness because by that time not only did we have a little bit of wind in our sails from winning the bump from 1025 to 11 within only 18 months of launching a campaign but there had been these incredible breakthroughs in the United States with the fight for 15, with the incredible impact of non-union workers in fast food outlets taking strike action in, you know, without even a union. And that was an incredible thing, reminding us all that the right to strike is not a privilege granted by legislation, but a, but a right that all of us have as long as we have the confidence to deploy it. And that was magnificent. And so the first breakthroughs uh, around the $15 minimum wage came at the SeaTac, a suburb of Seattle, and then later Seattle itself. So this was tremendously inspiring. And so when it came to relaunching the campaign and, 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 and establishing the demands that we wanted to run forward with, it, it, the, I think a really important point to, for, and lesson for us when we talk about having a big vision is that the big vision that we put forward was, was created and, and dreamt of by workers themselves. And what was so uh, incredible about it is that it was a big reminder to me that, that when we establish demands, it can't just be things that economists cook up in, uh, you know, in union halls. It can't be something that a small group of people think, I, you know, I think this would be a very good thing. It has to be something that emerges from workers' lived experience. And they have to be demands that are not only exciting enough to fight for, but they're realistic enough that workers in very precarious employment situations feel willing to put time and energy in. Because for if you really see workers themselves at being at the heart of these campaigns to improve their own wages and working conditions, then that they have to be the ones that, that, that set the pace of the campaign, if you will. And so, you know, we can't have a goal that's so lofty that people don't think it's achievable. And, and many workers would say to you, wow, they'd love that. Good luck with that. Let me know how it goes without actually putting their own, you know, blood, sweat and tears into it. And so the, the demand that workers came up with for the first phase of the came was the first phase of the campaign was actually $14 an hour. And, and, and after, after we got our first bump and when people saw the impact of the fight for 15 in the US, it actually built their confidence to set a higher goal. And so what we did is we, we launched the fight for 15 and fairness, where the, the minimum wage campaign, instead of people dropping the demand, they upped the ante by saying, we want a $15 minimum wage. And, uh, and then fairness was a very big comprehensive set of demands that workers themselves workshopped and identified as priorities on everything from equal pay for part-time, full-time temp agency workers to paid sick days, to uh, a whole myriad of other demands that I think it, in itself is a, a really important lesson from the campaign. So the big, a very big vision that allows you to fight on different fronts at different moments and a big vision that is shaped by workers themselves. Because if it comes out of workers lived experience, when you're inviting new people to participate in the campaign, you can be certain that those demands will resonate with those people because the, experience of, of, the experiences of work are so common and the issues in workplaces are so common because they actually come from workplaces themselves. So that was an, an incredibly important part of the campaign. But centering equity, I think, is absolutely fundamental to movement building because as we all know, 
decent work is a race equity issue. Because of systemic discrimination in our labor market, we know that the worst jobs go to people of color and newcomers. And we know that uh, unfair access to the labor movement is an issue of black justice as well. It's an issue of gender justice. It is an issue of migrant justice. And it's also an issue of climate justice. So by making sure that we're, we're interrupting uh, some of the assumptions that the, you know, that the working class movement is mostly white men, that we're centering issues of uh, race equity and, and uh, trying to interrupt white supremacy and anti-black racism and systemic oppression on every single front by amplifying those voices most affected by the issues we're raising, by building the confidence of those leaderships, I really believe it helped us to knit together a movement that is much less likely to be divided in the face of challenges that come before us. And if we have time later, I'll touch on how important it was that we took on anti-immigrant, anti-migrant racism in the lead up to the last federal election as a key and central issue of the fight for decent work. Um, so centering equity, I, I feel like it's, there's, it is not possible to make improvements in working, wages and working conditions if we don't actually bring all these things together. Uh, third lesson, don't shut up. I mentioned that we were con told continuously that the $15 minimum wage was out of scope. We were not allowed to talk about it to government. We were not allowed to uh, talk about it in, the con uh, in terms of the deputations that we were making to the review process, the, the committee hearings that traveled around the province. But of course, we wouldn't accept that, uh, that narrowing of the vision. And why would we? And of course, we talked about all the other things where the laws needed to be changed to make sure that workers had easier access to unions and so forth. But we always made sure that we talked about the $15 minimum wage. And not only that, we didn't allow the conversations to take place in back rooms and committee hall, committee rooms in the you know, government buildings. We made sure that this was a very big public conversation with as big a spotlight as we could possibly shine on those committee hearings as they traveled from community to community. We organized town halls in those communities to make sure that the public and ordinary working people had a stake in the outcomes. So, and by doing that, we were able to raise expectations, I think, because for so long, neoliberal politics has really been about taking away labor rights and attacking unions. And so by actually raising something to say, all workers should have access to at least seven paid sick days. All workers should have better paid vacation. All workers should be treated fair and equitably in the workplace. It really helped to change the conversation. So that was absolutely magnificent. And, and the extraordinary thing about you know, politicians and decision makers that when they say, you know, uh, it's out of scope, or you know, more or less saying, shut up, shut up, shut up, until all of a sudden it's not out of scope, until all of a sudden the, liberal, the Ontario Liberal government announced that they would indeed be raising the minimum wage uh, and it would be $14 an hour effective January 1st, 2018, and it would rise to $15 an hour by January 1st, 2019. And that was part of Bill 148 that had a whole suite of other uh, very important um, reforms included in it. Of course, not everything we wanted, and it certainly by any standard would be modest, but in this context, moving the agenda forward uh, was very important. So we won on the question of the minimum wage. We were able to extend uh, the, the job protected emergency leave to all workers, because many of you may know, uh, workplaces of fewer than 50 people uh, were excluded from the job protected unpaid leave. So we at the Workers Action Center had many people coming in who would be fired because they had to pick their kid up from school one day, or they would be fired because they had to take an elderly parent to the emergency room. So we were able to extend uh, job protected emergency leave to protect all workers. And we were able to win uh, two days, two paid days of these uh, emergency leave days. So of the 10, two were paid. We had been demanding at least seven, but two was certainly a start. We were able to introduce fair scheduling laws, so including of three hours of pay for on-call employees 
who weren't actually called in and that was a huge step forward for those workers. Uh, we got provisions to make it easier for workers to form unions and especially in sectors like the cleaning, um, security guards, home care, community service workers and so forth. So, and, and better protections for those workers for, against contract flipping, which is when workers and, you know, contract services workers get, you know, form a union and then the next thing you know, their contract is terminated and handed it to another company that isn't unionized. So these were huge accomplishments in Bill 148. And I must say the response uh, to that was like, well, great work. Bill 148 has been tabled. So what are you going to do next? I guess that's the end of the campaign. But of course, it couldn't be the end of the campaign because the moment that Bill 148 was tabled, the backlash from the corporate lobbyists and from the business community was ferocious. It was like a hurricane struck us. And literally the 15 minutes it took from attending the news conference where these reforms were introduced to getting back to our office, it felt like we literally were being swept away by this, you know, the hurricane force winds. So we had to mobilize right away because the business community was attempting to scare workers to say that this was going to be a disaster. It was going to reduce, reduce, result in job loss. The Chamber of Commerce employed extremely dubious uh, research, researchers to make claims that half a million jobs would be lost. It was absolutely outrage, outrageous, but it was intended to discipline workers and scare workers and to undermine public confidence in the changes. But we were able to mobilize because we'd been movement building for so long, we were able to push back against that. Um, the government buckled under the force of the business lobby and made some regressive changes to the bill. We were able to fight back against those uh, amendments and get the better language restored. And it felt like hand-to-hand -hand combat every single step of the way, um, right through until finally the bill was, uh, was passed in the fall of 2017 with the minimum wage rising to 14 in 20, January 1st, 2018. But this really is a lesson in staying mobilized. So you would think that, okay, the bill is done. Now we can relax. But oh no, one cannot relax even when the bill is passed because the next stage of battle was uh, enter Tim Hortons. Tim Hortons was attempting to discipline workers, you know, basically trying to undermine their confidence for dreaming big and thinking workers could get a, a $14 minimum wage and, and be better off. So what Tim Hortons announced, and it was really disgusting actually, because it was, uh, yeah, the owners of Tim Hortons were literally in their, you know, Florida beach house dictating the memo to the franchisees that was, was to outline the new policy that they were going to end paid breaks, that they were going to force workers to pay for their uniforms, and that they were also uh, going to scrap the free coffee and donut that every worker got on their shift, if you can believe it. That's how punitive it was. And so we had mobilization after mobilization. You'll see in the images that are, that are flowing through about trying to making sure that we're defending those workers, building their confidence, and really shining a light on Tim Hortons. By the way, we didn't call for boycott of Tim Hortons, although Tim Hortons as a hashtag initially trended when news of this hit the mainstream media, we didn't call for a boycott because it doesn't always make workers feel confident to think that maybe their jobs are gonna be threatened. Because of course, the only thing worse than a terrible job is no job at all. And so when we call for boycotts, we have to really make sure that those calls are coming from workers themselves because it can have the opposite effect of making people feel like we're actually threatening their livelihoods. So we didn't call for a boycott. But what was very interesting about the outcome of that uh, campaign is that uh, the company's uh, public brand was really diminished. It was the top, it was among the top three Canadian corporate brands in Canada and fell to 64th place. Uh, in terms of public respect. So that was a huge uh, impact on them. But the other interesting thing was how the corporations started to play themselves off against the others. So McDonald's came out with an announcement saying, oh, we love our workers. We're not like some of these other coffee, you know, outlets. We love our workers. We will be making no changes to the employment and working conditions of our workers. We welcome this. And likewise, a grocery store that also tried to reprise workers when the minimum wage went up quickly had to back off uh, when the public backlash hit. 
So those were all um, really important reasons to stay organized. Of course, we had the looming Ontario election, and we knew that that was going to be a hard battle because the previous government, the Liberals, even though their labor law reforms turned out to be very, very popular, it wasn't enough to do to undo all the unpopular uh, <laughs> governance uh, records or the, the they had a certain amount of unpopularity as government um and so even though the wage reform or the the employment law reforms were very 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 popular including the two paid days because as i learned through this campaign not even union members all have paid sick days as a matter of fact in fact many private sector unions uh don't actually have the paid sick days it's mostly public sector unions that have them so even though those reforms were very popular as the Ontario election approached, it became more and more clear that we were going to have a real challenge from the Ontario Conservatives. And many of you will know the history that the Liberal government was uh, defeated and the Conservative government of Doug Ford was elected. And we knew that this was going to be bad news, even though he campaigned on being the champion for the little guy and campaigned on decent jobs for all and so forth. So we had a big challenge. What do you do after the election? Um, well, we, we plan to have a demonstration, and actually this is a lesson we learned from the, from the U.S. movements. We plan to have a de demonstration within nine days of the election, no matter who won government, because we wanted to make sure that we continue, we wanted to make sure that whatever government was elected did not feel the pressure to roll back our wages and working conditions, and we wanted to put them on notice that we're going to fight for what we've got and we want to fight for more. Um, as it turned out, the Conservatives were elected. And, uh, and, and we knew that that was going to be bad news. So you can see from the slides, we had a demonstration. We put 2,000 people on the streets telling Doug Ford to hands off our minimum wage. And we were going to fight like, like no tomorrow to make sure that we kept as much of the Bill 140 as, as we could. And we felt confident because when you put forward class demands, it, cut through, it cuts through partisan lines. So while we knew that 70 to 80 percent of voters uh, supported the $15 minimum wage and, and over 80 percent supported paid sick days, we also knew that 64 percent of conservative voters also supported the $15 minimum wage. And so in our campaign, by raising class demands, we went into conservative ridings and mobilized people and had a conversation with people about why we needed to protect our demands, why we, why we needed to put demands on Doug Ford to say, uh, we want you to stand up to the big business lobby and, st and stand up for us. And we explained to them that now that Doug Ford is elected, the big business lobby is gonna pressure him to roll back our wages and working conditions. And we wanna send a message to him to stand with us, not with them. And we had many good conversations with people who couldn't, wouldn't believe us that Doug Ford wouldn't stand with us until he tabled the legislation that rolled everything back. Well, not everything, but many things. And in those moments, those people joined our campaign and they said, I because we built a relationship, because we were back in the communities week after week after week, we were able to have these conversations with them. And we're proud to have people who feel like they were misled in the last election to be part of our campaign and to be fighting uh, for decent work. So those are things that I think are really important to stay mobilized and keep fighting. And I'll just begin to conclude here with saying, with ending by, you know, we keep fighting, but I also want to take stock of what our movement collectively has accomplished. And again, with all, all kudos to the U.S. movements as well, I think the Fight for 15 really allowed us to, to build an international movement for decent work where, the, where we really were able to transcend borders, where people really felt like a victory in the U.S. Uh, was a victory for, for workers in Canada. And I feel like when we won a victory in Canada, uh, it was it was a victory for workers in the U.S., but also the fights for 15s that emerged elsewhere. There's a campaign underway now in the United Kingdom for 15 pounds. Now we had 1500k fight for 1500, which uh, it, uh, in Japan where the movement launched there. So all of these movements and across Canada, of course, we have variations of the fight for 15 and fairness across the country. And as a result of that, we have a, 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 the Alberta government was the first government to implement a $15 minimum wage. The minimum wage in BC has a path to 15. It just went up on July 1st. 
Uh, Nunavut just passed the $16 minimum wage uh, just in April, uh, I believe it was April. We've got fights going on across the country and in the last federal election, the, the federal liberal government promised a federal $15 minimum wage for those governed uh, by federal jurisdiction by 2020. And of course, the liberals also implemented many of the, uh, of the changes that we had won in Ontario. So by continuing to fight, we're able to respond because we have, we built a movement because we have these connections. We have changed the conversation around paid sick days. We've changed the conversation around equal pay for equal work. And, and, those, and 10 days of paid sick days is actually now on the table. The prime minister announced, and especially with COVID-19, the, the, the lack, the disgraceful lack of paid sick days for workers, meaningful paid sick days for workers anywhere across the country. We have the three fed days federally, but honestly, it is a scandal that workers do not have paid sick days. This is a public conversation now and expectations are very high for governments to deliver. And we wanna remind everyone that these need to be employer paid sick days because workers need seamless access to paid sick days. If, they're, if, it's three, if, it's, if, if workers have to apply after the fact through employment insurance or workers comp or whatever mailing coupon people dream up, that is not good enough for what workers need because they'll simply not do it. They'll go to work sick because when you're faced with a choice of putting food on the table for your kids or paying your rent or staying home when you're sick, you are not gonna risk losing a day's pay. That's the reality. But we're very proud of the movement that we've been part of building. We're in the process right now of going back to workers to say, okay, it's time to refresh our campaign. What minimum wage do you want to fight for? We're here in Ontario. We're uh, our fourteen dollar minimum wage was saved. We saved indexation as well. So uh, in on October first, the minimum wage in Ontario will be adjusted to fourteen twenty five. It should have been fifteen sixty five had the fifteen dollars not been scrapped by the Conservative government. But nevertheless, we were able to hold on to some of these things. We have still the legislation that we won that makes uh, client companies of temp agencies jointly responsible for workplace death and injuries. And that would be a huge, huge uh, protection for temp agency workers. It hasn't been signed into law yet, if you can believe it. So the legislation exists, the regulation exists, that all that needs to happen is for it to be enacted. So we're gonna to continue to fight provincially, we're gonna to continue to fight federally, but what is so fantastic is we really do feel like we're part of an international movement for decent work, and there's no going back now. And I think COVID-19 has, has even, it, for all the tragedies that has unfolded and the hardship uh, and so forth, it's really exposed the, the unfairness of our labor market, and it's, and it's really opened up a public conversation about how are we gonna make work decent and fair for everyone. And I'll leave it at that. Great. The audience is all now clapping. <laughs> it's a little bit more than 20 minutes. I apologize. Oh, no, that's totally fine. And these, these, these images are, are really fantastic, Pam. You're right that they really show um, the heart and, and bring that to life of what you, were, what you were speaking about. So thanks very much for sharing that with us. I wonder, I mean, I'm just curious, um, obviously, since here we all are remotely in this now, um, kind of COVID environment. Um, could you just speak briefly about how is that changing some of the items that are maybe on your radar? Um, has that, you know, impacted the momentum um, at all? Uh, you know, so much of, of a public movement like this is being out there in the world um, in, in a physical space. And I just wonder if you can reflect on that a little bit for us as, as someone who, you know, who has really been so involved in, in mobilizing? Well, that was, that is a very good question because it was definitely uh, a challenge when everything happened because of course the, the, because we didn't have the, the paid emergency leave days, the first impact was that uh, that when, when, when the provincial government in Ontario announced all schools would be closing, it, mm -hmm. it literally threw all sorts of parents into, into crisis because they would have to stay home and forego their work to look after their kids. And then shortly after that, the economy was shut down. And so all kinds of workers that had been in precarious circumstances to begin with were suddenly without work. 
And so certainly at the Workers Action Center, we had to very quickly retool to try to get, you know, like, you know, food boxes to people who were suddenly in really desperate situations. Uh, and then we also had to launch a campaign to ensure that there was a, an emergency response, uh, emergency funds, because what we learned from the SARS crisis a, a few years back is that the government was very slow to act to implement uh, uh, funds for people who didn't qualify for employment insurance. Mm -hmm. And uh, certainly in Canada, for, for your audience, I'm sure people are aware of how many people are falling through the cracks of employment insurance because of the terrible restrictions that were imposed about 20 years ago. So EI would not be a support. And even if people were to access EI, it is only 55, it only replaces 55% of wages. And so if you're a, a, a minimum wage earner that's already at a sub poverty wage, EI is just not gonna cut it. It comes nowhere near to it. So we immediately launched a campaign and then and, and we had to rely a lot on uh, online tools and phoning and trying to work with people to be phoning their MPs and MPPs. Uh, mostly at this point, we we're focused on the federal government because they had the power to make these changes. Um, and then to make sure that it was gonna be enough money. And it's interesting because in the, it, we fought and fought and fought to raise the amount of money that they were gonna provide as, as supports. And if you do the math, it turns out that the um, incomes of the $2,000 a month income support uh, roughly works out to be about $15, the, the equivalent of what a $15 minimum wage would be for, for workers. So those are you know, the ripple effects that you see in terms of how the campaign has been impacted. But it was, it was very, I will say those first few weeks were really disruptive. And so a lot of our work really did have to focus on the federal government. But what has been interesting lately is to see how the federal changes and provincial changes are, you know, now that we're sort of, we, we got CERB, we had to fight to make sure it covered as many workers as possible. Many workers were left out. We had to fight on everything to get gig workers covered, to uh, migrant workers covered, to undocumented workers cover, covered. So every, it felt like every centimeter was hand-to-hand -hand combat, making sure that these protections were in place. Um, but then when the provincial government has moved to start making changes that will make it uh, harder for workers to refuse unsafe work and harder for workers to leave their jobs if the, uh, an employer makes arbitrary changes like reducing wages and so forth. Because what you can start to see happening now, the, the threats to cut off CERB and there's the notion that somehow CERB is creating is incentives for workers to not go to work is just, you know, it's just rubbish. It's absolute rubbish. But you can see how the federal laws and provincial laws are starting to work together to try to drive workers back into the workplace when there's not been adequate protections put in place, when we, when there's no paid sick days in place, when worker, they're not even enforcing the wor workers' right to refuse. So I will say it has been a challenge, but we've been trying to find creative ways. And the last thing we did, in fact, this was one of the most fun things we've done, most moving and most urgent things is just last weekend, we had a car caravan through farm country in Ontario to draw attention to the deplorable working and living conditions of migrant workers, where there is a massive health crisis that is gonna affect all of us because hundreds of workers have been exposed to COVID-19 after arriving in Canada. These workers came to Canada, were isolated for two weeks, went to work in the farms, and then were tested positive for COVID-19. Two workers have died. Many more are intensive care. This is, it's an absolute scandal. And it all stems from, from four decades of neglect and disregard for the living and working conditions of those workers. And, and actually we lent our call to the demand for status now, because if everyone had the same citizenship rights, then we could all access the laws that are supposed to, that are supposed to protect us. And we're more able to fight to make those laws better. And believe me, we need every single person in our movement Otherwise, we're going to get blown back by the business lobby. Great. Thank you so much, Pam. I think we will stop there and let you get back on with, with your very important work. There's a no rest in your office for sure. Um, so thank you again so much for being here and delivering the, the 2020 Honorary H.D. Woods Lecture. It, it really has been a privilege to listen to you and um, and I think that uh, all of our conference goers and, uh, and, and people beyond will, will really um, take a lot out of, out of this video. So thanks so much again. Thank you so much for having me.